I'm so happy you're all getting along with each other so well. I don't think anybody even noticed I came up here, so it's good that you're building such sweet friendships and getting so much out of the study of God's Word. So tonight, we're going to be covering the rest of chapter 9 and chapter 10, and what I'd like to do is just start with a little recap uh, of what we've gone over the last couple of weeks, and then also give you an overview of what we're going to do tonight so that you can listen well. It's a lot of information, and it's actually kind of a hard message to accept, at least for me. This is a little bit of a hard message for me to accept from God's Word. It's kind of something that... I, I resist a little bit. I think God's really been pushing me to embrace uh, one of the ways that he works, a difficult way that he works. But for by way of recap, uh, we recently did the chapter... Uh, Isaiah 7, where Isaiah goes to see King Ahaz, who's one of the wickedest kings of Judah and the southern kingdom, and his people follow his lead um, in wickedness, but they've got a huge crisis in their generation, and that crisis is two big enemies coming against them, and those enemies are Syria and Israel, or the northern kingdom. So this is a, a civil war has happened in previous years, and the northern kingdom is coming against Judah along with Syria. And these two enemies are really dangerous enemies. Uh, there's, there's a lot of baggage that goes with that. And God is really encouraging Ahaz through Isaiah to trust God alone as their ally, not to uh, rely on any false sense of security, not to rely on other people or their limited resources, but to trust in God as a way of rescue. And um, hey, Bethany. I left my water in my little leopard bag. Would you mind bringing it up to me? Thank you. This is my wonderful friend, Bethany. She doesn't know it, but she's actually one of the illustrations tonight. Yeah, and and she's an introvert, so I bet she's really trying to, like, leave the building. No, look, she's walking out. She's like, I'm not doing this. Um, anyway, okay, so last week we talked about two really significant things that came out of this time. Thank you, Bethany, with um, Ahaz, and that really come out as themes in Isaiah. And that's that some of the way God works is that sometimes he rescues us, and sometimes he remnants us. We don't always know how he's going to do that. And we never want to be remnanted. <laughs> we always want to be rescued. But one of the ways God works and rescues us is by uh, making us into a remnant. And that is something that is really prized to God. So when, when our lives are torn apart like a remnant that is separated out from a larger whole, that God is doing something good and kind and loving and he values us. And he recognizes that tearing in our life, that shattering, and he seeks to build us back up to create something new. And that's his heart. It's a heart of goodness. Okay, so we're looking at these two ideas of the remnant, the rescue. And then tonight, these verses really, I just was overwhelmed with how God is pushing us to consider reality. And we think about how we all are, as humans, we've got to sort of classify our lives, our thinking within some kind of worldview. We all do it whether we recognize that's what we're doing or not. And these passages present three different worldviews for us. One of the worldviews is shown by the people of Israel. And they are one of the enemies coming against Judah. And God wants Judah to learn from the mistakes that their brothers, their kinsmen from the northern kingdom are making. And the worldview that they have, the worldview that the kingdom of Judah is also adopting, is really a religious worldview, but it's one of religious hypocrisy. So they lean on God, they recognize God, they kind of give God a tip and a wave, but they're really living for themselves, and it's just a hypocrisy, and that separates them from God. And he says, this reality is unacceptable. And he kind of throws that down. He throws that down with his judgment. The other worldview that we see is the kingdom of Assyria. And Assyria is the great evil empire, this torturous nation uh, that rises up really against everybody around them. Assyria is for Assyria, and that's it. And they want to eat up all the land they can, become powerful, selfish, just they want their kingdom to be the greatest. 
And they really have a completely pagan, selfish worldview. It's just all about Assyria and nothing else matters. And God throws down that worldview too. He says, this worldview is unacceptable. A selfish worldview where everything revolves around you and you're the only thing that matters, unacceptable. And what he puts up as the picture is what I'm going to call a remnant reality. It's the worldview that the remnant of God should have. And that's what he's going to encourage us to have, to have the perspective of a remnant, the mindset of a remnant, the habits of a remnant, the relationship with God that his remnant should have. And we're going to see that in this passage. So what we're going to go through in these two chapters are really just three steps. God is going to share about what his judgment on Israel is going to look like because Israel was the enemy of Judah. And God had promised Judah that he would lay down their enemies. So he's going to punish Israel for coming after Judah. The second thing we're going to look at is Assyria. Assyria was used against Israel, and God is still angry. Even though God used this evil empire to accomplish his purpose, he's still angry at the injustice of this nation. He's still angry at the evil, and he's going to to settle that issue too. And then the last thing in this chapter is the remnant. He's going to talk about how he deals with his remnant. So let's get started. Let's start in Isaiah 9. I'm going to read verses 8 through 12. The Lord sent a word against Jacob. Uh, Your Bible may have uh, my, I'm using my New King James Study Bible, and it says the punishment of Samaria, and that is synonymous with Jacob, with Israel, uh, with Ephraim. They're all talking about the northern kingdom. So the Lord sent a word against Jacob, and it's fallen on Israel, and all the people will know Ephraim and the inhabitant of Samaria, who say in pride and arrogance of heart, The bricks have fallen down, but we will rebuild with hewn stones. The sycamores are cut down, but we will replace them with cedars. Therefore, the Lord shall set up the adversaries of resin against him and spur his enemies on, the Syrians before and the Philistines behind, and they shall devour Israel with an open mouth. So what is going on in these terrible verses? Well, God is describing, he's predicting through Isaiah, the downfall of the northern kingdom, which did happen um, within 10 years of the prophecy that Isaiah gave. Uh, He gave the prophecy to Ahaz, two, two prophecies about children. One was that Emmanuel would come and be a sign for us that in our greatest crisis, God would be with us. And then Isaiah also had a son that uh, his name meant the, the spoil speeds, the prey hastens. It means God is going to do what he says he's going to do. And God said he would punish the enemies of Judah. And so this is here predicting God punishing this enemy. But God wants Judah to learn something from these people, and he wants us to learn something from these people, and it's very practical. Uh, What this is saying here is that the people, when they were experiencing discipline of the Lord, they did not respond the way God wanted them to respond. The trauma that God allowed in their life, the discipline that he brought, the shepherding, the redirecting of these people, he was reaching out to them, even in his anger, so that they would turn back to him, so that they would repent and find out what it was that was dividing them, because their sin separated them from God. And he was saying, this is unacceptable. This is a reality we cannot live with. Okay, so we might think of this with, um, you know, a husband who continues to commit adultery. This is not a reality you can live with. The husband may say, it's okay, everything else is fine except for this one area, but it's not. That's such a divisive area. There cannot be the relationship unless that issue is reconciled or resolved. We may think of this if there's a child who has an an addiction and they're stealing from their parents to maintain this addiction. The child can't live there and have a right relationship with their parents if they're stealing. That is something that separates them 
from that parent, and that has to be reconciled and resolved. Uh, we may experience this in business, right? You've got business partners, and the partners have to be working together for the good of one goal. But if there's one partner that's going off here, this is not a balanced relationship. It's not a realistic relationship unless the partners are working together for the good of the company or the relationship. And this is really the attitude that God has when he comes to this passage. He says, I demand a right relationship. We must have reconciliation. We cannot move forward without a restoration, and that must be full and complete. And here's what's happened with these people. They've gone through these difficulties, traumas, discipline. They didn't want to be restored. They weren't looking for reconciliation. What they wanted is for life to go back to normal. And we know that because what they said is these traumas happen, and they said, well, we'll just rebuild. We ran out of one material. We'll just get another material and rebuild in a different way. Uh, they just say, we'll set this up. We'll get hewn stones. We'll cut more wood. We'll just go back to normal. And gosh, I really relate to them. Uh, when Stephen had Guillain-Barre syndrome, this wasn't really something we verbalized, but we, this thought was just present in our minds all the time. I just can't wait until everything's just back to normal. I just can't wait till it's back the way it was. But you know, that's not really what God wants in our life. He doesn't want us to go back to the way we were. He wants us to change and move forward and grow with him. He has a different reality for us. And all of the things that come into our life, whether he causes them or allows them, whether they're in the form of discipline or pruning or shepherding, whatever they're there for, they're always designed for us to turn back to him and to look up to him and to find the new thing that he has ahead for us. And it's so hard for us to change our mindset, our worldview, our mentality. Uh, it's so natural for us to just want things to go back to what we were comfortable with, familiar with, what we were okay with. And this is a, a huge problem in all of our spiritual lives. It's a big problem in my life, um, especially for me with having the kind of illness I have. I look back and I'm like, man, it's been over a decade that I've been struggling with this. And I spend so much of my time wishing for it to go back the way it was. And it will never go back to that. And the longer I wish for it to be the way it was, I've had 10 years of missing out on the things that God may have for me. And so we've got to discipline ourselves. We've got to change that mindset and change that reality for ourselves to not look to what's normal, but to respond to our circumstances, the things in our life, the way God wants us to, unlike these people. Uh, this is another interesting verse. 13 says, For the people do not turn to him who strikes them, nor do they seek the Lord of hosts. Okay, uh, another version will say they did not inquire of the Lord. Uh, this is pretty interesting. God is asking people when they encounter hardship, trauma, discipline, if they feel like God's hand has been stretched out to strike them, he's, he's bewildered that they're not inquiring of him what is going on. It lets us know that his purpose and anything like that is for us to pursue him. That's not my response. When, when I feel like God's hand is out against me, I want to run the other way. You know, I want it to stop. I want the pain to stop. I want relief. I want God to bless me. I want God to rescue me and make it easy. And uh, instead, God is letting us know right here, no, he wants us to inquire of him. And he's trying to train us to get in the habit of inquiring of God when difficult things happen. Um, this is interesting. There's a commentator who said, God will not settle for a polite religious unreality. God is relentless in stretching out his hand to us to help us understand the truth of life 
the reality of the world, and he sets that reality. And no matter how many bad habits, how many false senses of security we have, he is going to continue to push those down and push those down until we understand the true reality and we follow after him. Uh, I had an interesting experience uh, a few months ago with my friend Bethany and my children. And uh, I will say this about myself. I am not the most organized mother. I am definitely not the best cook. I have many weaknesses as a wife and mom. But I might be the most fun mom. <laughs> okay, that might happen. When I was a kid, my mom would, we had a landline back then, and sometimes she would wake up in the morning and all day answer the phone in a British accent. And so we just always had a lot of fun in our house. My mom and I were always joking. And so my kids and I are always having fun. Fun was like one of the first words I taught my children. F-U-N, spell it. Mom is fun. And this is like a big thing that we're going to have fun every day of our lives in our house. We're going to have fun. And so I picked up this tradition and I speak to my children in lots of different accents all the time, and they do it back to me, all of them. And I did have someone in the Tuesday Bible study ask if Stephen participates in this activity with us, and you will not be surprised to find out he absolutely does not share in our fun game of accents. But we had to run into Target the other day, and my little ninth grader, Sydney, uh, Bethany was with us, and she said, hey, I've got an idea. When we go into Target, Let's all speak in a British accent. And if anybody forgets, they're not allowed to talk the rest of the time we're in there. So we all agree, okay, okay, this is what we're going to do. And so we all start giggling. We go in with this nervous energy, and we're like, oh, cheerio, it's so good to see you. I hope we have a delightful time in Target today. I hope we find everything. And then I start, like, chiding the children. No, no, don't go over there. Reach up. Get it for me. Come along. Let's go. Hurry, hurry. We have things to do. You know, we're just doing this the whole way. Everybody's doing it. Bethany's doing it. The kids are doing it. We get like almost to the end. We're in the produce section. We just have one or two things to get, and we're ready to go out. And a lady taps me on the shoulder, and she says, I thought I was the only one. Where are you from? And I thought, oh, my goodness. You're from England, right here in Little Rock. <laughs> well, the thing is, see, I was just playing a game with my children, and uh, I really live right here in Little Rock. You know, I'm not from England, you know, and I'm having this horrible, like, out of body experience where I'm like, I I'm trying to like shut the conversation down, but I'm I'm stressing out and I'm just talking and I can't stop my mouth. I just keep talking. And the bigger problem was I didn't know if I should stick with the British accent or like go to my normal voice. And so like an idiot, I'm going back and forth. Like, if she didn't already think I was the biggest crazy person in Arkansas, like, now I'm confirming it. And then I have this strong desire to be friends with everyone I meet, and so I just keep talking to her and asking her questions about herself and how she got here. It was so horrible. And Bethany and the children, like, slowly started moving away from me <laughs> and not talking at all. It was a terrible, hilarious experience. I'm thinking this can't possibly have been happening to me. But here's the thing. I could put a crown on my head and walk all through Target with my British accent, and maybe I could convince everybody in Target that I'm Kate Middleton. But I am never going to sit on the throne of England because I am not a British citizen. And God cares so much for us that we understand reality, that he will knock down our games. He will knock down our insecurities. 
He will pursue us through every hardship, every circumstance for us to open our eyes to the truth around us. And he will accept no lies, no falsehood, no worldview that stands against his truth. We must accept his reality. Okay, let's, I want to talk to you about the next verses. This next section really, all the way through the 16 through 21, also 10, the first four verses, they just keep talking about the sad state of Israel. <clears throat> These people who refused to accept God's reality. They didn't want to accept God's worldview. And as a result, their lives kept getting worse and worse. They kept going in those pattern of the woes where they wanted more and more. Their sin was greater and greater. Their lives, the messes of their life got more and more tangled, farther and farther from God. And they really, they, they weren't able to come out of that. And this is why God is doing such a huge intervention in their life, is to wake them up and to bring them back. And it hurt. Uh, their lives hurt. They were hurt people, and they were hurting other people. And that's what these verses describe. Uh, it's God really calls them out. He says they're, they're evildoers, and they're hypocrites, and they're living lies of injustice, and they're taking advantage of people. Uh, there's really even an interesting verse here. It says, um, verse 21, uh, every man shall eat the flesh of his own arm. Manasseh shall devour Ephraim and Ephraim Manasseh, and together they shall be against Judah. Uh, this is really interesting. Like the last, the five of the last kings of Israel came to the throne by assassination. Wow, that was dangerous to be a king. Uh, they were no longer patient to wait for God to move. They were actively pursuing a selfish gain in so much of a way that it, it was a murderous situation. It was a violent, difficult situation. And God is just bringing this to an end. And he uses the evil nation of Assyria to come and end this kingdom of Israel. Okay, so now we're going to enter into the next section, and this is where God talks about Assyria and what God is going to do to judge this kingdom. So this is interesting. God holds his children even more accountable, right? The more we know about the truth and more we know about God, really the more responsible we are in the way that we live our lives. And so he doesn't give his children a pass. He doesn't say, well, your hypocrisy is okay because you belong to me. Uh, it's okay that you did evil because you're a Christian. I'm going to give you a pass. No, he tells everybody, you need to face reality. And now he's also uh, approaching those who have this pagan worldview. They don't really acknowledge God at all. They don't recognize God as a part of their life. Uh, they're not trying to please God. They're living for themselves, and, and they make no apology for this. And God really steps in, and he gives us a very different picture of reality, and that's in these verses. It says, Woe to Assyria, the rod of my anger, and the staff in whose hand is my indignation. I will send him against an ungodly nation and against the people of my wrath. I will give him charge to seize the spoil, to take the prey, to tread them down like the mire of the streets. Yet he does not mean so, nor does his heart think so. But it is in his heart to destroy and to cut off not a few nations. For he says, are not my princes altogether kings? Is not Calno like Carchemish? Is not Hamath like Arpad? Is not Samaria like Damascus? As my hand has found the kingdoms of the idols who carved images excelled those of Jerusalem and Samaria, as I have done to Samaria and her idols, shall I not do to Jerusalem and her idols? So what's going on here? Uh, this is actually interesting, this first verse. God takes some responsibility here. He said, Assyria is the rod of my anger. I kind of cringe at this. God is using evil to accomplish a purpose in his people. That's kind of hard to accept, but, but God is taking responsibility for that. 
This is interesting to me too. In verse six, it says, I'm going to give Assyria charge to do this. And it's really in direct response to the prophecy about Isaiah's son to seize the spoil, to take the prey. So he's affirming his prophecy that this situation that happened is as a result of the prophecy uh, that this is what his will is for the people. Uh, and that's a really hard thing to accept that God is allowing this. Um, he also is letting us know what the Assyrians are thinking. And like I said, they've got this pagan mindset. They have no idea that God is using them. Uh, they're just living for themselves. And it's really interesting here. It says, the Assyrian's heart does not think so. He has no recognition that God is moving, is sovereign over the world. He also kind of reveals his strategy. The Assyrian strategy of war was to go into another kingdom and take over that kingdom. And then they would leave that king in place or they would put someone in place over that kingdom. Um, they didn't have power. They were just like a puppet king. But the Assyrians here are saying, I mean, you say your God is the king of kings, but I'm the king of kings. Like, I'm the king who's put all these other kings on the throne. I'm the one in charge. Like, you think you have the king of kings, but I obviously am the one in charge. And then here's this um, kind of explanation of all the kingdoms that he's conquered and showing that all of their gods were not powerful enough to stand up against him. And that's what he believes about the kingdom of Israel. And he even calls out and he's like, Jerusalem, I'm coming after you. Judah, you're next. I'm coming after you. And don't worry about your God's not going to be able to stand up to me. And this is God's answer to the Assyrian attitude. He actually says in verse 15, Shall the axe boast itself against him who chops with it? Or shall the saw exalt itself against him who saws with it? As if a rod could wield itself against those who lift it up. Or as if a staff could lift up as if it were not wood. Therefore, the Lord of hosts. All right, this is pretty... This is a pretty comprehensive explanation. Um, and these, these verses, God uses a lot of metaphor and different ways to say the same thing. And the reason is because he knows this is a difficult subject and he wants us to think about it in a lot of different ways. He wants us to understand this metaphor from whatever perspective we come from. But he does here take responsibility for what he does. He recognizes this pagan worldview, this attitude of arrogance, of pridefulness that the Assyrian has. He is almost kind of laughing here. He calls Assyria like an ax in his hand. So yes, Assyria is doing the evil, but God is wielding that ax or like a saw. Uh, Assyria is doing the evil, but God is controlling that. Um, this is a difficult thing for us to accept. I have a little picture I'm going to ask Lauren to put up on the screen here. And it's a picture of my dog. This is my dog, Sheba. And she's six pounds. And she's just like a little princess. And I take her to carpool every day. And I like put her in my purse. And I carry her around. And... We have become those people that, yes, we dress her in clothes. And, like, I feed her breakfast every morning. I mean, it's really pathetic, like, how our whole family is at her service. So this dog is really important to us. And we got her when we moved here. She was kind of, we said to the kids, you know, if we move, we'll get you a dog. And that's what happened. We got this dog just a few months after we moved. And like I said, she's just so precious to us. We love her so much. She is um, just, if, if the kids are crying, she goes to them. If I'm sick, she curls up right next to me. If there's anything stressful going on, she seeks us out. If we watch a scary movie, at the scary part, she comes and she sits beside us. I mean, she is so faithful. She is so supportive. She is so loving. She's always happy to see us no matter what. I mean, we just love, it's ridiculous how much we love this dog and even put her in our family pictures. It's so sad that we have become these people, but that's who we are. 
And this precious dog that we love so much, she came in from being outside and her giant eyeball was bulging out of her head. It was horrible. And we had to find an emergency vet. I don't know if you know this, but there is a dog ophthalmologist surgeon here in Little Rock. <laughs> and by experience, she's excellent. But we had to take our little dog to this emergency vet. And it turned out to be this long kind of traumatic experience, taking her in all night, uh, this terrible, gruesome, I mean, just nasty looking thing. And, you know, as a mom, I realized how serious this is. She could lose her sight. She could easily get an infection. She could lose her life. Uh, this dog is so precious to us. And here's the thing about our dog that is so valuable to us. Uh, we read an article about dogs and their intelligence, and it lifted a hundred and listed 150 dogs. At the top for intelligence was like German Shepherds, Labradors, things like that. 138 was our dog. <laughs> Poor baby, she's not the smartest dog. But we love her so much, and she is of great value to us. But here's what was so sad. She had to have an eye surgery, and it didn't work. The stitches came out. She had to go back for another surgery. And she's sick and whimpering. She's got the IV. She's got her eyes sewn up. She's got the cone. Uh, it was this horrible situation where I had to hand her over to the surgeon after she'd experienced pain and trauma. And, you know, it really helped me kind of understand these passages a little bit better. Because I didn't want to hand her over. I knew if I took her to that doctor, she was going to put her to sleep. She was going to stick a needle in her arm. I knew she was going to do surgery on that eye. I knew it was going to hurt my little baby. Uh, I knew it would be a long recovery. I knew the dangers more than even my dog knew, right? She doesn't understand that she could lose her eye. She doesn't even understand what it would mean for her to be blind, but I do. She wouldn't even understand the threat to her life, but I understood that. I understood all the implications that would come for me handing her over to the surgeon. But I took responsibility, and I handed her over. Like that axe in God's hand, as the Assyrians were, that's what I had to do to my dog. And you know what's really sad? I tried to explain it to my dog. <laughs> Literally, before we took her in, I like sat down and got in her face. And I'm like, listen, Sheba, I love you. And I would never hurt you. And I only want good for you. And I promise after this is over, I'm going to take care of you. And I will feed you. And I did. I'm who took care of her? I did. I put medicine in her eye. I shoved that medicine down her throat. I fed her by hand. I gave her water. I took care of her. I comforted her. But I did take responsibility for putting her under the knife because it was the best thing for her. Now, she couldn't understand that because she's a ding dong. <laughs> okay? And we can't. When we experience the horrible traumas in life, there is no way we can understand all that God is doing. Now, he has spent passages of Scripture trying to explain it to us. But there is a barrier because he is God and we are not. And just like little Sheba, we've just got to trust sometimes that he knows what he is doing and that even evil he can use for good. Now, when I started studying this passage, even yesterday, I wasn't really ready to deliver the message because I really didn't want to accept it. I just don't like that God allows evil in our life, sometimes such devastation in our lives to accomplish his purposes. 
But the more I'm sitting in these scriptures, the more I'm teaching it, the more excited I become that God is willing to stand back and take responsibility for what happens in this world. And that he is willing to do the hard thing because he wants to save our life. And he has a purpose behind all of it. And he is promising to be there as Emmanuel, that he is with us to comfort us, to heal us, to help us, to restore us, to pay the debt for us. That's what it means to be Emmanuel. And he has taken up that gift for us. Now we come to the last portion of these sections, and this is really God telling us, okay, now the religious hypocritical worldview is not acceptable to me. And the selfish, pagan, prideful, arrogant worldview is not acceptable to me. But here is what God expects, a remnant reality, a reality that we can live with, that we can all accept, and a reality he wants for us because it's a reality of healing and hope and life and goodness. So Isaiah 10, 20 begins, And it shall come to pass in that day that the remnant of Israel and such as have escaped of the house of Judah will never again depend on him who defeated them, but will depend on the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, in truth. Pan, this is a powerful verse. God is knocking down all of this, allowing so much trauma and devastation because he doesn't want his remnant, his faithful people, to depend on anyone else that's going to hurt them. God says, I will heal you. I will restore you. I will be with you. I will comfort you. I will remnant you. And he says, don't go back to these other false gods, this false sense of security. And man, this really was convicting to me. Here I am, the teacher up here. And this week, I was confronted with realities, and I like fell back immediately into my old patterns of thought. What can I do? What resources do I have to solve this problem? Um, How can I strive? You know, I have a temperament that just is like an overworking, striving, just a personality to try and try and try and work and work and work. Uh, Stevens told me I would be an awesome Old Testament Christian because I would love to earn my salvation. (laughs) You know, like, it's just, I've got this personality where that's just kind of my go-to. And it's so ingrained in me. And God says, that's not, it's not going to work. You can never save yourself. You'll never be good enough. You'll never have enough resources. You're not the Savior. I am. And he's Messiah. And he comes to comfort us, to be with us in our struggles. And he comes to stand against our enemies. And he forces us to let go. He knocks out all of these crutches so that we have to rely on him as Savior and Lord. And this is how a remnant stands out. A remnant doesn't go back to those things of codependency or anxiety or bad relationships or bad habits or our comforts or all of these things that we normally go to to find our security and to find our stability. God says, no, you come to me for those things and let the other things go. And he wants us to recognize that all of those things that we naturally run to are the things that are going to hurt us. And God wants us to be healthy and strong. Uh, God doesn't want us to be in bondage. For us, he wants us to be free and full of life and healing. And he knows the things that we naturally want to are the things that put us in bondage and hold us back and pull us down. And so he asks us to look at things in a new way, not to depend on them. And then verse 21 is really great. These next few verses, it says, the remnant will return. The remnant of Jacob return to the mighty God. For though your people, O Israel, will be as the sand of the sea, a remnant of them will return. The destruction decreed shall overflow with righteousness, for the Lord God of hosts will make a determined end in the midst of all the land. So this is pretty outstanding and super packed with meaning. God sums up this area by saying, I will do what I said I will do. 
And he's proved that by fulfilling this prophecy against Israel. But he's even taking it further and saying, I will do what I said I will do in in Isaiah's time, the present time. God says, I will do what I said I will do in the future. So the prophecies that Isaiah had that happened during his lifetime, but later in years in this, God fulfilled those. We also have the Emmanuel prophecy that God says, I will make that happen. And Jesus was born as a baby and he died on the cross and he rose from the grave and God did that. Even today, there are prophecies that continue to be fulfilled, that God does what he says he will do. And this verse even extends to us further, to our future, to our eternal future, that he promises there will be a time when he will deal with evil once and for all. So in our lifetime, we see God dealing with evil on a small scale, on a personal scale, on a bigger scale. Um, Sometimes there are evils and injustices in our life that during our lifetime are never resolved. But God promises that all will be resolved on a determined day. And he reminds us that that day is coming and he knows what day that is. But he's also got several other really powerful things in here. The remnant will return, the remnant of Jacob. Uh, No matter how evil these people are, no matter how much they have sinned, God says his hand is still outstretched. Uh, and, And one of the people at my table, one of these sweet ladies was saying, that's so comforting to me that even when his hand is stretched out in discipline, or trauma, or difficulty, or shepherding, or pruning, that it's still reaching out to us. There's no point we ever come to where he fails to reach out to us. He continues to reach out, and he's always wanting to restore us as that remnant. So all we have to do is keep turning back to him. Uh, That's hard for us to do, but it's a habit that he wants us to to make in our lives, create that habit of always turning back anytime his hand is outstretched. If it's outstretched in blessing or in hardship, whatever it is, he wants us to come back. And he repeats this idea of remnant. And I love this too. He says the remnant, but he just says you turn, when you turn, you turn to something and that's to the mighty God. It's this recognition of his sovereignty. And he's saying, you come back to me. And I love this because it really pulls out these two huge themes in the book of Isaiah. And that's the theme of Messiah, Jesus as Savior, and remnant. That those who put their faith in him, he will be a Savior to them. And th- these are awesome themes. Um, let's go down here. I, I love this God's really made this dramatic statement of him being the Messiah and us being the remnant and combining these two truths together and and building this alliance, this remnant reality that he wants us to have. But he's so patient that he knows how hard that is for us. And so he follows that up with these really significant verses in verse 24 and following. It says, therefore, thus says the Lord God of hosts, he establishes himself as sovereign. Oh, my people, he calls them with an endearment. People who dwell in Zion, do not be afraid of the Assyrian. He shall strike you with a rod and lift up his staff against you in the manner of Egypt. For yet a very little while, and the indignation will cease, as will my anger in their destruction. And the Lord of hosts will stir up my ang- um, the Lord of hosts will stir up a scourge for him, like the slaughter of Midian at the rock of Oreb, as his rod was on the sea, and so he will lift it up in the manner of Egypt. Okay, this is just totally awesome. I mean, you got to get really excited about these passages, and you should go back and read these, because God is, again, reminding people that that what he's asking them to do is difficult and scary. He's saying, don't rely on anything else. Rely on me as your Savior, your Messiah, your Anointed One, your Emmanuel, the God with you. And he says, the Assyrian will come up against you. That's not what we want. We want God to say, oh, don't worry about the Assyrian. But no, he says, this frightening, terrifying thing is going to come up against you. 
And he calls him out in several ways, the rod, the staff, the saw. He's going to come up against you. But God says, don't be afraid of him. Even when he strikes you, don't be afraid of him. Because something unlikely is going to happen. And he, he really gives them courage. And the way he wants them to have courage is to remember what God has done in the past. So when we come up against those scary things, we remember that he is sovereign, that he is mighty, that he loves us, that we're his people, we're his remnant. And we're supposed to remember what he did in the past. And he brings up these two experiences. He brings up this uh, battle of Midian that we talked about. It's Gideon in the book of Judges. And that was a completely unlikely victory. If God had not intervened, there was no way the people would win. And then he also brings up um, their experience coming out of Egypt during the Exodus when they were leaving their bondage to come and uh, be embraced as God's chosen people. And they were defenseless. I mean, literally slaves walking walking out on foot with no army, no weapons, just completely defensive when one of the biggest armies in the world, Egypt, is coming after them. And God wipes them out. He says, don't worry about it. Even if they strike you, don't be afraid of them because I'm the Messiah and I'm going to take care of you. And the following verses even illustrate how close the enemy is going to get to them how the enemy just keeps coming after them, getting closer and closer. And for the people in Jerusalem, when the Assyrians did come and Jerusalem is up on a hill and they looked out at those horrible enemies camped out before their eyes, terrifying their children, it was a scary thing. And yet God said, I will win this victory for you in an improbable way. Okay, and here's my favorite verse of the whole thing. Get excited. Verse 33, highlight this. Behold the Lord, the Lord of hosts. He will lop off the bow with terror. This is so exciting. They are looking their enemy in the eye. I mean, the terror is sitting right in front of them. They are so afraid, and they should be. This is a natural fear. And God says, don't look at them. Behold, see what I am going to do. Uh, This is so convicting because, like I said, we come up against the trauma in our life, and we want to look back. We want to get things to get back to normal. And God says, no, look for something new. Look for me to show up in an unlikely way. Look for me to bring an improbable victory in your life. Visualize it, take note of it, focus your eyes on it, quit looking at the wrong things, quit living in the wrong reality. You need to have a remnant mentality where you will behold the Lord God, you will see what he is going to do, and he will be a victory to you. I absolutely love love this verse. And I want to close by sharing um, something that Corey Ten Boom used to share. And unlike most of us, uh, Corey really lived through a similar period in history, like these people lived with the Assyrians. Um, Some have called the Assyrians the Nazis of the ancient Near East. Uh, because they were that torturous, that terrifying, that evil, that horrible, wicked mentality. And Corrie ten Boone was a, a woman with few resources uh, who stood up to this terrible enemy. And she was struck down by them. She was harmed by them. She was traumatized by them, tortured by them. And yet she came out so resilient, so healthy so full of light because she embraced this remnant reality. And she used to speak about forgiveness, about her experience, about the sovereignty of God and how we can trust ourselves and his good hand. And what she would do is she would hold up a tapestry and she would show one side of that tapestry and it would be this, just the back of the tapestry and it was this mangled, knotted, nasty mess, if you've ever seen the back of a tapestry like that. And then she would flip it over, and on the other side was this beautiful crown. And she said, although the threads of my life have often seemed knotted, I know my faith 
that on the other side of the embroidery, there is a crown. She would often quote this poem. Let me read it for you now. It's called The Weaver. My life is but a weaving between my Lord and me. I cannot choose the colors he weaves so steadily. Oft times he weaveth sorrow and I in foolish pride. Forget he sees the upper and I the underside. Not till the loom is silent and the shuttle cease to fly will God roll back the canvas and explain the reasons why. The dark threads are as needful and the weaver's skillful hand as the threads of gold and silver and the pattern he has planned. Let's pray. Lord, we take the time to praise you for being Lord of hosts, for being Messiah, wonderful counselor, mighty God. We thank you for your willingness to take responsibility for the hard things, for the things we don't understand. We thank you for your wisdom that you do understand, and we thank you for your compassion that there is never a time when you are unwilling to comfort us, to minister to us, to help us. We also thank you that you are unwilling to accept an unreality for us to live in. You are unwilling to accept hypocrisy and division and selfishness and pride. You're unwilling for us to keep the things in our life that will harm us and hurt us and separate us from you. Lord, I pray for myself, for each one of these women, that we would embrace your truth and your reality. And Lord God, I pray that you would help us to behold what you are doing, to see that you are moving. Lord, so many have come in this room with hardships and heartaches. And we pray, Lord, that you would shine your light on truth, that you would create something new through the remnants of their life and that you would be Emmanuel to all of us. In Jesus' name, amen.